A very good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to uh, day 11 of uh, the HSMA uh, training program. Um, so uh, this week uh, we are continuing our journey through uh, the machine learning uh, module. Um, so last week uh, we had our very first uh, machine learning session. We introduced um, the basics of uh, machine learning uh, and you had a chance to uh, get used to some of those uh, core concepts by uh, seeing if you could work out what kind of films I liked. Um, and we had some great uh, uh, attempts at that. Apparently, it seems I, I, I really like, um, especially 130 minute films seem to be the sweet spot, um, which I noticed myself watching a 130 minute film the other the other day. So I, I've now become aware of uh, uh, my preferences. Um, but uh, uh, hopefully that gave you a bit of a good grounding into uh, some of the stuff, because actually the, in this module, we're going to be looking at all sorts of different um, machine learning approaches. And I'll keep saying this throughout the uh, throughout the module, but actually machine learning is as much as an, uh, of an art form as it is a, a, a science. Um, and actually, if you if you're working on um, a project that's going to involve machine learning, you'll probably spend a lot of your time actually just trying things out, trying out different approaches, uh, 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 trying to fine tune those models. Um, just trying different ways in which you might be able to try and teach a machine, um, uh, uh, because actually there's very, uh, uh, very often no uh, hard and fast right answer uh, with this kind of stuff. So uh, we're basically taking on a journey through various different approaches that you can try, um, uh, and as well as some other um, uh, interesting sort of tangents uh, when we get onto things like um, reinforcement learning and uh, synthetic data creation uh, later in the module um, as well. Um, but this is very much a, a, a let's try different things out. But what we're doing today is we're starting uh, with some of the simpler approaches first. Um, so we will come on to in a few weeks time uh, neural networks, uh, which is known as deep learning. Um, which uh, is obviously huge now and uh, with good reason, these approaches are incredibly uh, powerful, um, but sometimes they're overkill for what you need. Sometimes it's, it's, it's usually best to start as ever with models um, by trying out some of the simple things first and then seeing if you gain an advantage um, by applying some of those more complex uh, deep learning approaches. Because if you don't, then you're probably better off just sticking with uh, some of the simpler approaches uh, for your particular uh, problem. Um, so we're going to be talking about logistic regression this morning. We're going to apply that um, to a couple of different uh, examples and you'll hopefully see, I think you'll all be pleasantly surprised that the code for this in Python is not particularly complicated, mostly because you are going to be using uh, wonderful libraries that do all the hard work for you underneath the bonnet. Um, so actually you'll see the code's pretty straightforward for this kind of stuff. A, a, a lot of the effort really comes in in uh, determining how you're going to assemble these models together and, and process your data and all, all, all that kind of stuff that we'll cover. Um, so before we kick off, I'm just going to, uh, a little bit of housekeeping, so I'm just going to mention uh, a little bit of a teaser. So um, uh, Sammy and I uh, met yesterday, as we do every Monday, um, to talk about the uh, revision sessions that Sammy's been doing. Um, so we think we're going to change those up in some way, and we've got a few ideas uh, for what that might look like, um, and hopefully um, some uh, uh, interesting ideas that will uh, provide benefit for all of you. Um, uh, so watch this space, we're hopefully going to get that in place for the end of this module. Sammy, I don't know if there's anything you want to sort of add on that at this stage uh, or not. <laughs> yeah, I think not much. It's it's all a bit up in the air. But as I say, we've got some really, ex or as Dan says, we've got some exciting ideas in the pipeline, but we want to make sure there's still spaces for people to ask questions when they're stuck. But we're also, you know, the, there was relatively low attendance. Um, you know, for those of you who did come along, I hope it was really useful. And I did. It, I, it was great to um, have a chance to chat to you. But I think there's potentially more we can do um, to make sure that everyone's getting benefit from those additional sessions. So, yeah, watch this space. Brilliant. Thanks, Sammy. Yeah. So, uh, as Sammy said, watch the space and uh, we'll share more details of that in due course. Brilliant. OK, uh, let's crack on with uh, today's session. So first of all, I'm going to say a massive uh, thank you to my colleague, uh, Mike Allen. Uh, so Mike um, actually spearheaded a lot of the 
um, uh, modern uh, work that we do within uh, the Penco team. Uh, he was instrumental in pushing us all to uh, embrace free and open source. Uh, I remember the day uh, he shoved a Linux laptop in my face and said, try that. Um, uh, so, uh, but, but he was also instrumental, particularly because of the uh, Samuel Stroke work that he leads, um, uh, which is a big work stream uh, using machine learning uh, uh, for, um, for stroke issues. Um, uh, he, uh, he's been particularly instrumental in, 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 in uh, developing um, the machine learning side of our work. Um, and Mike also developed um, uh, over a number of years this fantastic uh, um, uh, repository of um, uh, 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 various uh, tutorials on uh, various things in machine learning, various different approaches, things about data pre-processing and all that kind of stuff, all based around the Titanic data set, which we're going to be looking at today uh, as well. And um, uh, a lot of the notebooks that you're going to be looking at both today and in a couple of the other sessions in this module um, are based on uh, on Mike's original uh, notebooks, just uh, a kind of spruced up for a particular uh, for the HSMA purposes. So um, I would encourage you, we're certainly not going to be covering uh, all of the stuff that Mike covers. Um, and so I would highly recommend this as an excellent companion for you um, to explore some of the um, the things that we won't have time for in the course. Um, indeed, at the end of this session, uh, there will be a couple of things that I would say are essential reading uh, if you're going to be doing machine learning. Um, and I will guide you to Mike's uh, materials on those. Um, but I'd highly recommend it. And the good news is because we've taken a lot of our materials uh, from Mike stuff using that as a basis. Um, uh, hopefully it should all uh, flow quite nicely. It's a nice uh, sort of companion for, for what we'll be covering. Okay, so uh, as I say, last week, uh, we, uh, we we talked about some of the, the key concepts in, in, in machine learning as well as explore, explored my uh, taste in movies. But now uh, we're going to start looking at uh, some actual machine learning uh, approaches. Um, and we're going to start with these uh, simpler approaches, which are usually a, a, a good uh, first go to whenever you're doing something like this. Um, but as I say, later in the module, we will be looking at um, uh, deep learning. Uh, which is the uh, kind of neural network uh, side of things uh, as well. Um, and you'll also be using neural networks a lot in uh, the uh, natural language processing module, the next module uh, as well. Um, so uh, specifically today, we're going to look at something called uh, logistic regression. Uh, we're going to look to see how we can uh, do logistic regression uh, using some nice libraries in uh, Python. Um, and we're going to have a look and see if we can use a logistic regression model um, to first of all make some predictions about who would survive uh, the sinking of the Titanic. Um, so you've already uh, had a glimpse of this data before. I can't remember which session it was. I think it was the pandas. I think it was the second Python session we did this year uh, where I gave you um, this uh, Titanic data set, uh, which is a well-known data set and got you to explore it a little bit uh, using pandas. Um, well, uh, we're going to be using this data set quite, quite a bit uh, going forward and for good reason. So this is quite a famous data set. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, um, there's an online service called Kaggle, um, which uh, you will become no doubt familiar with if you go down this rabbit hole. Basically, Kaggle is uh, an online data science community and it basically hosts lots and lots of different kinds of resources so it's got um uh, uh data sets in particular which are really useful when you want to try things out. it's got these big data sets that people have shared that you can use um it's got uh, uh some data science environments that are, that are sort of hosted on the web um it's even got competitions uh where um uh companies post problems and uh people try to compete to come up with the best solutions uh, for those um sometimes with cash prizes as well so it's uh, often worth a worth a look and the titanic data set or titanic machine learning from disaster uh, as it's known there's the link to the original data here um it's basically one of those classic competitions um that turns out to be a really useful one uh, when you are trying to learn about machine learning and also when you're when you're looking at um, exploring lots of different machine learning approaches as we are uh, here. And basically, uh, this is this is real data uh, from passengers aboard the Titanic um, 
to and the idea is that we use various machine learning approaches to try to predict uh, which passengers survive uh, the sinking of the Titanic based on various data um, that we have about them and people compete as I say to um, uh, with their own algorithms to try and see if they can get um, better accuracy uh, because this is a classic one you know that you'll when you go online you'll see loads of people with 100% accuracy and stuff but this is this is a, a, a kind of long solved problem but it's still a very good one uh, to uh, to have a look at. Okay so um, in order to talk a little bit about logistic regression I'm going to talk a little bit about how it works uh, under the hood. Um, there will be a little bit of mathematics coming up. It, I've kept it very friendly because I, I don't particularly like uh, math, math, mathematics. I hate seeing equations and things like that. Um, so uh, I apologise in advance. There will be a little bit of that, but I will talk it through very, very carefully. And also with flag up, you don't really need to understand the intricacies, just the general gist of what's happening. Um, it's good to understand how these things work. Now, you could get away with not understanding at all how it works and just as you'll see just use these logistic regression models but i think it's worthwhile if you're going to be a you know a critical consumer of this kind of stuff that you have a sort of broad understanding at least about uh, what's happening uh, under the hood so in order to understand logistic regression we're going to first talk about what we mean by regression um now many of you may well be familiar with regression and have done uh, some form of regression uh, in the past but for those who haven't regression is basically um, referring to a set of approaches which are trying to predict um, some kind of output value given one or more input values and that's all we mean by um, regression um, and uh, if you come from a statistical background um, the output value is often referred to as uh, the dependent variable or you might hear it was referred to as the response variable um, uh, in machine learning terms we tend to call it the outcome or the label um, and uh, this is the value basically that we're trying to predict this is the thing that we're trying to uh, uh, to predict from our inputs now the input values again if you come from a stats background very often called the independent variables or the explanatory variables um, but if you come from a machine learning background uh, you're, we refer to them as features and we talked a lot about features uh, last week uh, it's basically all the same thing these are basically the data values from which we are trying to predict the output the dependent variable the outcome the label whatever you want to call it um, so some examples of how you might use regression things like uh, trying to predict uh, the level of revenue from advertising spending is a classic regression example uh, another classic regression example trying to predict house price uh, from the size of a house. Uh, these are all classic examples of how regression has been used uh, for many, many years. So that's what regression basically means. Um, so uh, let's now talk about linear regression, which is something that you may well have used before. Um, and linear regression is just one of these types of regression. Uh, and as the name implies, it's where we're trying to fit a straight line uh, that best fits all of the data points that we have. So we're trying to find a line that, that kind of best describes the trend in our data. Um, and that will then help us to predict future values. Um, and uh, the line is described using this equation here, y equals a plus bx. And basically that just uh, y here is our um, dependent variable, the one we're trying to predict, our outcome. Um, a is the intercept, that basically just means where it cuts through the y-axis uh, at this point uh, where x is zero. Uh, B is the uh, slope or gradient of the line, so how steep the line is. Um, and x refers to the independent variable uh, or, or feature, uh, so the thing from which you are trying to predict. Now, um, in this example, uh, uh, this pictorial example here, this is a, a two-dimensional example, essentially representing one independent variable or feature. Um, if there's more than one, uh, then uh, the data and the line uh, will be in multi-dimensional space. But the principle remains the same, and it is far easier to draw this uh, 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 for you to understand it in a two-dimensional format. Um, but the principle applies whether you've got one feature or 200 features. Um, it's just you will be in multi-dimensional space if you, are, um, uh, if you have lots more features. Now, a common method for uh, fitting a linear regression uh, model 
um, is using something known as uh, least squares regression, which is actually quite a uh, straightforward approach. It basically just says the line of best fit is the one uh, which minimizes the sum of the squares of vertical deviations between data points of the line. In other words, um, if we take the distance from this point to the line and then this point to the line, we square each of those distances. We square them because they could be above or below the line and we don't particularly care about that. So we, 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 we just want to look at absolute uh, distances um, and we want to find the line that uh, minimizes that. In other words, the one that, that lays closest to the most points. Um, which is basically what we'd understand by a line of best fit. And that's a very common approach if we're doing uh, linear regression. It's fairly straightforward um, and can be very useful uh, for a lot of approaches. However, we're not talking about linear regression. We're talking about uh, logistic regression. Now, logistic regression is a little bit different. Logistic regression, we're trying to predict a probability that are uh, given a set of inputs or our features um, that they belong to a particular class. So this is obviously useful for classification problems. We talked about uh, classification problems last week where we're trying to say, OK, we're teaching a machine that given this set of inputs, it belongs to we think this case belongs to this class or this class. Um, and we can have, you know, multiple classes, but very often it's binary. Um, and very often it's 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 a kind of boolean in, in terms of true or false is do they do they have this do we think they've got this condition or not do we think they're going to be uh, this patient's going to be admitted to hospital imminently or not um, uh, and a lot of the kind of problems you will be looking at um, uh, in your project work will be binary classification problems um, that's just the, the nature of the kind of work that you'll be doing um, and linear uh, sorry logistic regression is actually really useful for these kind of classification problems. Um, so uh, we can use things like uh, a logistic regression to try and predict, for example, the probability that we might pass an exam against uh, a mock exam grade or the probability that a passenger on the Titanic, given a set of features, would survive the sinking. And that's exactly what we're going to be looking at um, today. Um, so I said the simplest form of logistic regression basically just looks at um, uh, binary classification. Uh, there are more complex forms to allow you if you did need to look at uh, examples where you've got three different classes or more. There are ways you can do that. We're not going to look at that uh, here, um, but there's plenty of information out there um, if you do need to look at that. But I, I, I would say most cases, as I say, for what you'll be doing, binary classification problems are 95% of, of, of what you'll be doing. OK, so to explain a bit about logistic regression, I'm going to first talk a little bit about the logistic function. OK, so logistic regression is basically named logistic regression because of the logistic function. Uh, and uh, it's the logistic function that defines our regression line. So whereas linear regression, uh, which basically is so named because it's a straight line, uh, the logistic function, uh, the logistic regression is so named um, because of the logistic function. The, log the, 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 the logistic function is an example of something known uh, as a sigmoid function, um, which uh, for those of you who don't know, basically a sigmoid function is just a curve that shapes like an S. Uh, and you'll see an example in a moment. Uh, you probably see them uh, lots. Um, that's uh, one that has a sigmoid S shaped curve. Um, and that's basically what we mean by uh, a sigmoid function. Now, um, we can set up a logistic function to take any value and then map it to a value between but never reaching uh, two limits. And very commonly, those two limits are zero and one uh, for a lot of what you're doing, but they don't have to be. Um, and you can use a logistic function to map between other limits, but uh, commonly used between zero and one, and that makes it particularly powerful for generating outputs that can then represent probabilities. So we end up with an output between zero and one, and that represents a probability of um, something belonging to either this class or this class. Um, and so here's basically the logistic function. Apologies for the maths. Um, as I say, you don't need to understand the intricacies, but this isn't quite as bad as it looks. Uh, first inspection. Um, this basically just says L, which is the uh, maximum value of the curve. 
um, which uh, if we use a one there, which is what essentially we'll, we'll, we'll be doing, um, then it maps values between zero and one, and therefore we get probabilities out. Um, uh, over one plus uh, e, uh, e is just uh, Euler's number, the, the, the natural number, uh, to the minus k, and that k is just the steepness of the curve, uh, multiplied by uh, this difference in here, um, where x is the value to be mapped, which is our input, um, and uh, x0 is the midpoint of the sigmoid curve uh, in the middle of the s, basically. Don't worry about the details of that. Um, basically, the key takeaway from this slide is that um, uh, we're going to be using, rather than a straight line, uh, we're using a uh, uh, logistic regression, we use a logistic function, which is basically based on an S-shaped curve. Um, and that S-shaped curve will allow us to produce a probability between 0 and 1 that a particular input or set of inputs belongs to a particular classification. Um, and that's how we're, we're going to use it. And we can use the logistic function as follows. And indeed, um, when it comes to neural networks, we will see how we use logistic functions all the time in uh, neural networks too, for exactly that reason. So uh, just to give you a little bit of a pictorial example uh, here, so that's the, the blue line here, that's a linear regression example, uh, linear because it's just a straight line. Uh, this is an example, this S shape here, uh, this is a logistic function, uh, it's got our S shaped sigmoid curve, um, and we can use that to basically determine what's the probability that uh, uh, given a set of inputs, um, again, we're using a two dimensional example here. So we just have one input here, which is X and the output Y. But again, uh, this applies to multi-dimensional space as well. But this basically says, given this input, what's the probability that it belongs to, uh, in this case, class one. Uh, and as you can see, as we go, uh, go along here, that there's an increased likelihood that it belongs to this particular class. That's basically what it's doing under the hood. So that's that's what a logistic function is doing. And basically what a logistic regression does is it combines that logistic function, that way of mapping values so that, uh, on an S-shaped curve so that we can get a, a kind of classification probability out of it. It combines that with a linear function uh, that has uh, weights, or if you come from a stats background, you may have heard them referred to as coefficients, which are associated um, with each input value. And basically those weights or coefficients determine how important each of your inputs are uh, to making a, 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 a determining the probability that it belongs to a particular class. So much as last week you were trying to do this as human beings, trying to work out uh, what uh, features were most important in trying to determine whether I'd take a DVD to a desert island. Um, that's effectively what you're doing is trying to come up with weights uh, uh, associated with each of these features. Um, and that's at the heart of any machine learning approach, determining uh, these weights, uh, what, what things are more important, what things are less important uh, for coming to a, a prediction and often a classification prediction for the kind of things we'll be looking at. Um, so basically, in simple terms, uh, the equation, uh, the logistic regression equation, uh, which is this horrible looking thing here, um, basically fits a linear model. That's the thing in blue there, um, which has weights for each input and then converts that using a logistic model, the thing in red, um, which you've just seen, uh, in order to output a probability between zero and one. OK, you don't need to understand the mass, but that's basically what it's doing. It's combining this linear model that has the, the weights for each feature with a logistic model that then converts that into, OK, and that's that you know, gives me a probability of 0.6 that it belongs to class one. OK, you can breathe now. Here's a here's a, here's a picture of a, a kitten. Uh, no more mathematics for a minute. Uh, um, but hopefully that's given you a general uh, flavour of uh, how it works generally. That's basically what it's doing. It's a bit more complicated, obviously, than linear regression. Linear regression is quite simple to understand. You're even in probably multi-dimensional space. You're, you've got a set of points and you're trying to find the, uh, a straight line that best fits them. Um, the district regression is a bit different. You've got uh, clusters of data points and you are trying to find um, the uh, a classification probability uh, model that determines the, uh, um, the probability that a particular set of data points belongs to one class or another. 
And as I mentioned earlier, the good news is you don't need to understand the maths really behind a logistic regression in order to perform uh, a logistic regression in Python. Um, but I do think there are benefits in understanding broadly how, how this works. Um, uh, and it's uh, actually really, really easy to do a logistic regression uh, model in Python, far easier than trying to understand those, uh, those equations, I would argue. Um, and uh, particularly easy if you've got uh, the uh, the Anaconda library. If you haven't, you can still use this. But uh, if you've got it, then this already comes installed because it comes with a, a, a fascinating package uh, called uh, Scikit-Learn uh, or SKLearn, um, which is basically a free uh, machine learning library that contains huge amounts of machine learning uh, algorithms. It contains lots of handy functions that allow us to uh, do uh, various pre-processing on data, things like splitting our data into training and test sets, as we talked about last week, um, all that kind of stuff. It's got huge amounts of stuff that we can we can tap into far more than you'll ever use. Um, and Scikit-Learn has been around for a long time and it is widely used. Um, when we come on to, it's also got things on neural networks. We won't use the neural network stuff uh, uh, in Scikit-Learn when we come on to Neural networks, networks will be using uh, something called TensorFlow, um, which is uh, one of the most widely used packages and developed by Google. But for now, we're going to be using um, Scikit-Learn. Um, and as I said, if you've got Anaconda or a variant of, then it comes with uh, Scikit-Learn already installed. Um, if you don't have it, uh, Anaconda, obviously you can still install this package, but Anaconda comes with this uh, already. Um, uh, this means that if you've got Anaconda, um, which most of you have, um, then this will be, Scikit-Learn is in your base environment. Um, note, that, uh, remember uh, uh, some time ago, I said that when you create new environments, some, but not all of the many, many packages that come with Anaconda um, uh, are also installed in, um, in new environments. Uh, uh, NumPy is, I think I can never remember which one. Yeah, NumPy always gets transferred, but I don't think Pandas doesn't. I think that's the right way around. Um, Scikit-Learn does not. So if you create a new environment in Anaconda, by default it won't have uh, Scikit-Learn in there. You can you can install it uh, in that environment, um, but it won't come by default. Which basically means for today um, you're going to be using your um, your base Anaconda environment because everything you're going to be using. Uh, is uh, available in the base Anaconda environment. Um, so assuming we've got uh, Scikit-Learn installed, uh, we can then just import um, uh, uh, the bits we need. And it's important we just import the bits we need. As I said, Scikit-Learn is a huge package. We don't want to just say import SKLearn um, because there's far, there's, oh, sorry, there's far too much uh, in there. Um, uh, uh, that would be very inefficient. Um, so this is uh, unlike something like SymPy, where you, it's kind of self-contained and you just you tend to just import SymPy as a whole. Uh, we don't tend to do that, particularly with uh, a lot of machine learning packages. Um, so we just import the bits we need. And so for this, uh, if you want to do a logistic regression, uh, we'll say from sklearn.linear model, uh, import logistic regression. And that will give us the logistic regression stuff in, uh, in scikit-learn. Now, um, Assuming that our data has already been pre-processed in the format we'll need, and I'll come back to that, because in the real world, your data will not be pre-processed. Uh, so if you go on to do a machine learning project, you will need to do some pre-processing, and I will point you to Mike's materials, which indicate exactly the kind of thing you need to do. It's fairly straightforward, but you need to do that. Um, but so that we don't spend, you know, the first uh, half of uh, uh, this module talking about um, very routine things that you need to do to pre-process your data, uh, and uh, we want to make sure we've got time to talk about the machine learning bits, um, then uh, uh, we just flag this up. The, the data you're going to be working with this, in this module is nicely pre-processed for you in the main. Um, so you don't need to worry about that, but just be aware in the real world, that doesn't happen. You'll have to get your data into a format that makes it machine learning ready. That's not particularly complicated, uh, it, but it is a step you have to do. Uh, and as I say, we'll point you to materials on how to do that. Um, but assuming our data um, has been pre-processed, which ours has, um, then there's basically three things that we need to do with our data after that point, um, before we give it to a logistic regression model. The first thing we need to do, we need to divide our data 
into features, which remember are inputs, and uh, labels, which remember are our outputs. So the things from which we are trying to predict and the thing we are trying to predict, we need to separate that out. We need to divide our data into training and test sets, uh, exactly as we talked about uh, last week, where we said we slice our data um, and we carve off a bit that we give to the machine to learn from, and then we keep a bit aside so we can then test to see how well it's learned by trying it out on data it hasn't yet seen uh, to see how generalizable it is, because if it's not generalizable, it's, it's rubbish, it's useless to us. Um, and then uh, we will apply some uh, something known as feature scaling so that all of our feature values are on a similar scale. And we'll come back to that um, shortly. So let's have a look at how we do each of these uh, steps in turn. So let's start by uh, how we would divide our um, uh, input, input data, our feature data, from our labels. Um, now, um, the way in which we do this in Python is actually really, really straightforward. Uh, so we, uh, our feature data, our inputs, uh, we tend to denote uh, with a capital X. Okay, so we always use X for inputs, Y for outputs. But we tend to use a capital X, and the capital letter basically signifies there are multiple features for each example. So that's a, that's a historic uh, tradition uh, that we use capital X lowercase y um, and uh, the y is lowercase because there's just a single output label uh, for each so we've got multiple inputs to predict a single output uh, so we use x and y in that way um, now assuming that our data is stored in a pandas data frame uh, and that's the best way to pre-process uh, your data so you've got got it nicely into uh, a data frame, all the data we'll be giving you will be pre-processed into pandas data frames. Um, and assuming that data frame is called uh, data here, but obviously it could be called anything you like. Um, and uh, assuming that our label, our um, out output, the thing we're trying to predict, uh, is stored in a column called outcome, but again, it could be called something different in your data. Um, then we can store our features and labels as follows, just with these two simple lines of code. So capital X here, uh, that's our um, our feature data is basically uh, our data frame, but with the uh, it's the entire data frame, all the columns except the outcome column, um, which makes sense because we've got a data frame that contains our data, which has a load of input features and the output, the label, the answer, uh, um, the classification in most cases. Um, that's the basically for our input data our features we want all of the columns apart from that one so we can just use data.drop um, to say give me the entire data frame apart from that column uh, and conversely the label data is that column we've dropped so we just grab that column from the data frame and that or a variant of that is going to be a very common thing that you write uh, to split your data into uh, features and labels. It'll be a variant of that just with the names changed for whatever your data frame's called, whatever your columns are called. So that's easy. That's all you have to do. Okay. Second step, we need to uh, split our data into uh, train test splits. Uh, now you remember um, I talked last week, there is such a thing as a train validation test split as well. Um, we won't cover those today, but we will get onto those later in the module, particularly when we get into, they're particularly useful for uh, neural networks. So when we start covering neural networks, you'll see a lot more of train validation test splits. But for now, we're just worrying about training and testing sets. Um, so uh, we need to split our data into training, a training set and a test set. And it sounds obvious, but we have to do that for both the features, the input data and the labels. Um, now, fortunately, uh, sklearn, uh, scikit-learn has got a module that basically allows us to randomly split up our data into training and test sets incredibly easily. Okay, uh, and it's this train test split thing. Again, this is something very commonly that you'll import. Um, so we have this import statement here from sklearn uh, dot model selection import train test split. That then gives us access um, to a train test split, um, and this then single line of code will do all the magic for us. So this basically says, I want you to perform a train test split uh, on this input data. So this is, this is our features. So here's our, um, uh, our capital X. Uh, this label data 
lowercase y and then we just pass in how big do we want our test set to be um, as a proportion uh, so between zero and one so here i'm saying carve off 25 percent of my data to be the test set and it will randomly then uh, go in and uh, split your data into a training set and a test set and the test set will be 25 percent of your data and the training set will be 75 percent of your data now we'll come on to later uh, a, a more advanced way of uh, doing this that's a bit more rigorous um, but for now uh, this is a, a nice simple way and we can, we can just split our uh, data into training and test um, so that's what this bit's doing and what it will then return is a number of things now hopefully you remembered um, uh, that's a typo you should say module one but you'll hopefully remember from module uh, one where we talked about um, returning uh, functions that return multiple outputs uh, so sometimes when we have a function we could have a function that returns a number of things at once and sometimes it returns it as a single thing like a list that stores those multiple things but sometimes it returns those things separately and we looked and saw how that worked we saw we had a return statement that had return this comma this comma this etc and it would then return those outputs in that order and we also saw that then we had to catch them in the same order on the other side when we call the function um that's basically what's happening here so the train test split function when we call that uh, it's uh, if we were to look at the code for train test split, uh, then you'd see that essentially it's got a return statement that will return these four things in this order. The first thing it returns is the uh, the training data for the feature, the feature, our features, uh, the X capital X, <coughs> excuse me. Then it returns the test data for our features, then the training data for our labels, and then the test data for our labels. OK, so it's uh, uh, split everything nicely. So we've got um, the uh, both features and the corresponding labels um, split uh, into training and uh, test sets uh, for us. So and it always comes out in that order. X train, X test, Y train, Y test. That's and you'll get used to that order. OK, so that's the, the train test split will always spit them out um, in in that way. OK, so we said we had three steps to do. Let's talk about the third step, which is a little bit more um, interesting, perhaps. Um, so uh, we talked about the fact that um, we may have lots and lots of different kinds of features in our data. Um, and um, therefore, our machine learning algorithm may be working with uh, data that has, um, it, so for example, in our, our, our various columns of our data frame, um, that have lots and lots of different kinds of values. So let's imagine that we've got a, a, a data set that contains things like age and number of admissions to hospital and mean daily calorie intake. Now that would seem, you know, that that's that's probably the kind of data set that you may well be working with. But let's take a moment to reflect on the kinds of ranges of values that we would expect to see for each of these things. Well, for age, um, we'd expect probably, uh, you know, values up to about 100, um, depending on the kind of data we're looking at. Um, it may well be that we've got a, a spike for younger people or older people, depending on the kind of data we're looking at. Um, number of admissions of hospital, well, that's likely gonna be a relatively low number. We suspect that'll probably be single digits for, uh, in terms of what you're looking at, but probably in the range of single digits for most people. Um, and then calorie intake is gonna probably be in the thousands. Okay, so uh, think, well, that's obvious, Dan, why are you telling us that? Um, the point, key point here is that these features that we need to try, from which we are trying to predict something are on very different scales. Okay, we've got age here up to about 100, uh, probably up to 10 for this one, and in the thousands for this. Okay, why is that a problem? Well, it is a problem if we're going to try and do some machine learning on it um, because of the uh, the weight that I was talking about, or coefficients, if you like, coming from a stats background. Because if we've got data that has vastly different kinds of uh, scales of numbers, um, then 
we we run into a couple of issues. The first issue is we get tend to get poorer learning performance because the algorithm will naturally tend to give more weight to features that have high, uh, values with higher orders of magnitude. So um, in the previous example here, you may end up with a machine learning algorithm that uh, puts more weight on the, um, the calorie intake, the daily calorie intake, even if that's not the most important feature in, in, in truth, um, simply because it will be more inclined to do that because those numbers are in the thousands, okay? So you can end up with a situation where you're accidentally biasing towards particular features. And it also makes it really difficult to compare weights between features because you're on these very, very different scales. And that means it's much more difficult to try and ascertain uh, what are the most important or less important features, um, which is obviously something that we, 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 we want to try and understand. Um, so instead, we use something called uh, feature scaling to try and get all of our features on the same kind of scale so we don't run into these problems and the two most common ways in which we can apply feature scaling are normalization and standardization okay so normalization is basically where we uh, take all our values and we rescale them so that all of the all of our values in our data fall between two values typically between zero and one, although it doesn't have to be, but normally it's between zero and one. Um, and you'll often heard to, uh, hear to it referred to as min-max normalization. It's the same thing. That's basically what we're referring to. You take um, all of your data, and so all of your values will then fall uh, within that more manageable range. Uh, standardization is similar, but a bit different. It's where we center all of our values around a mean of zero, and a standard deviation of one, okay? So unlike normalization, where we've got a bounded range, no value can go below zero, no value can go above one. With standardization, we don't have a bounded range. Uh, there are no hard limits, and we can accommodate outliers a bit more randomly, a bit, a bit more randomly, a bit more naturally, um, but most of our values, because they're centered around a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, will be within a far more manageable distribution okay so let's just have a look uh, at these approaches in turn uh, again apologies a tiny bit more maths uh, again you don't have to worry too much about this but the maths here are actually pretty pretty easy um but as I say, again you won't need to worry too much about the details of this so min max normalization uh, as i say that's where we're scaling all our values to, uh, between two numbers typically between zero and one um and uh, this equation will do the trick um, and basically, this is a, a very simple equation. It basically says that to get a normalized value, uh, uh, so to translate a, uh, one of your original data values and make that a normalized value, all you need to do um, is subtract the minimum value in your data set from that value and then divide that by the range of values. So the highest value minus the lowest value. That's all that equation is doing. OK, so let's imagine um, if our data contains the values 2, 5, 7, 9 and 100. Um, then uh, the value 5 would be normalized as uh, the value 5 minus 2, which is the lowest value in our data, divided by the range, which is 100, uh, the highest value minus 2, which is the lowest value. That's 3 over 98, so that's 0 0.03. Uh, and why this works? Well, let's have a look. Uh, if we took the highest value in our data, which is 100, that would be normalized as 100 minus 2 divided by 100 minus 2, which is going to give us a value of 1. That's the highest we can go. And our lowest value, the value of 2, would be normalized as 2 minus 2 divided by 100 minus 2. Well, that's obviously 0 divided by 98, which gives us 0. OK, so that the lowest value is 0, the highest value becomes 1, and then everything else is something in between. Um, and as I say, you can, if you so choose, it's a pretty straightforward equation, you can min-max uh, normalize using Python manually. In fact, in the exercise uh, in uh, Mike's notebook, you'll, you'll, um, the first thing you'll do is to do that manually, um, uh, although you won't have to type out the code yourself. Um, 
but uh, you you'll then see uh, in the in the proper uh, sort of follow on bit um, that uh, you don't actually need to do that. And there's of course a class in sklearn that allows us to do this. It's called MinMax Scalar, and it does all the hard work uh, for us. Um, and so here we've got an example of um, a, a, a MinMax uh, normalization. Uh, and this code is pretty straightforward. We've just imported NumPy. Uh, we've imported this MinMax scalar. Um, the only reason I've imported NumPy here is just so that I can randomly generate a two-dimensional array with two columns and a thousand rows. And basically it samples each of those random values from a normal distribution. Now, obviously that's just to give you a random data set to show you how this works. In a real world application, you don't do this bit you've got your real data. You're, that's what you're normalizing. Um, this is just to demonstrate uh, because I didn't fancy sitting there and typing in uh, thousands of values. Okay, um, so this imagine this is your data set. We've just created it randomly here. Um, all we need to do if we want to do a minmax uh, normalization is to create a scalar object, a minmax scalar object there, an instance of this class. Uh, and then we call the fit transform uh, method of that scalar um, on our data, which we've just called X here. And that'll do it. That's it. That 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 does all the magic for you. Uh, and in fact, let me just show you, there is an example of this in your uh, uh, in your lecture examples. Uh, is the code there. And I've just added a bit that prints out the original data uh, and compares that to uh, the normalized data, just so you can really see how this works. Let me just run that. That's not going to work because I'm not in base. Uh, let me just switch to base. Here we go. Uh, sorry. Oh, now zooms in the way. Apologies. Run that again. Right, hopefully this should work. There we go. Right. So here's our original data. This is just the randomly generated numbers that we got. And here you can see snippets of the normalized data where everything falls between zero and one. Okay. So that's basically all it's doing. Very, very simple. And of course, uh, this is random, so every time I'd run it, it would come out with different values. But in your case, uh, you would be, you'd end up with the same values uh, if you're using the same uh, data set. So that's min max normalization. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, standardization uh, uh, is uh, the, the kind of opposite, is where we scale uh, all of our um, data so, so that our uh, input data has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Um, and again, we've got this equation here so that we could so choose to do it manually if we want. Um, but again, we don't have to. Um, and again, it's a fairly straightforward equation that basically just says, if you want to get a standardized version of a data point, um, then you take, uh, um, sorry, to get your standardized data, you take uh, each uh, value in your original data you subtract uh, the mean across your data and divide it by the standard deviation of your data. That's all it is. OK, uh, so um, each value, uh, uh, take the mean, uh, subtract the mean and divide it by uh, standard deviation. Again, let's just see how that works. You understand what's happening under the bonnet. Uh, here's our example again, 2579, 100. Here are our data values. Uh, the mean of those values is 24.6 and the standard deviation is 42.23. So you can then see how that would standardize for each of those data points. So uh, the value of 2 would become 2 minus the mean, 24.6, divided by the standard deviation, 42.23. So you'd end up with a value of minus 0.54. 5 becomes minus 0.46, uh, and so on, so on. 100 becomes 1.79. And uh, you can see they're all centered around zero and have a standard deviation of one. And if you don't believe me, uh, you can take the mean of those values and the standard deviation. You will find the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. Okay. Honestly, it does work. And I did it, double check it just to make sure. So as I say, you can just, uh, you could do this manually. And again, you will uh, for the initial bit of the exercise, just so you can see this working. Um, but in practice, you don't need to do this. Uh, and then you'll use... Um, a uh, standardization uh, uh, package uh, from uh, sklearn. Um, and there are actually quite a few different ways you can do this. Even sklearn itself has a number of different approaches. Uh, I, we're going to use something called the standard scalar class because I think it's really elegant uh, and it's really straightforward and easy. And I think this is probably one of the most popular approaches now. Um, again, 
Here I've imported NumPy just to generate a random data set just as I did before. I, but I, here I import the standard scalar from sklearn.preprocessing. Again, all we need to do if we want to uh, standardize our data, I'll create a scalar object from the standard scalar class. Uh, and then on that, I will call the fit transform method, the same name of the method as for the normalization uh, approach on our data. And again, that will then do its magic. It's just that we'll have standardized data instead of normalized data. So a couple notes on that, uh, because I suspect there may be um, some questions around that. And I suspect in the chat, uh, probably somebody's already asked at least uh, one of these. First note, common question is, OK, so they both seem to do a, a similar thing, but differently. When do you use normalization? When do you use standardization? Um, the answer, as with most things, machine learning is there is no hard and fast answer. OK, it depends what you are trying to do and what tends to perform uh, best for your data. And ultimately, that is a, a standard answer for a lot of machine learning questions. However, I will say that there is a general rule of thumb. Um, and generally speaking, uh, logistic regression, which you are looking at today, tends to work best with standardized data and neural networks tend to work best with min-max normalized data. Um, and I, if you if you have trouble remembering that, I have a little mantra that I always recite to myself, um, which is alliterative, which says neural networks are normal. And that helps me remember um, it's a neural network, probably best to normalize my data. But again, that, you know, it, that's not a hard and fast rule. There are very few hard and fast rules in the world of machine learning. But generally speaking, logistic regression, best for standardized neural networks, best for normalized. OK, which means uh, we're looking at uh, logistic regression this morning. So you're going to be standardizing uh, your data when you come on to, to, uh, to do that in a minute. Um, the other thing to note is that generally when you're standardizing your data, good practice is that you standardize the training set data and then use the training data's mean and standard deviation to standardize the test data that um, it, uh, ensures that you don't have kind of crossover that you are not the model isn't uh, doesn't have access to things that it shouldn't at that particular stage um, uh, so um, uh, and it also means that the predictions that the model generates are on the same scale as the predictions generated by uh, the model um, I will, however, note that in the example that you'll be looking at this morning, uh, for simplicity, you're not doing that. So you will see that you will just standardize each of them separately and work with that. So for this example, that's fine. Um, and for some of the other examples that you'll look at, um, uh, it comes from Mike's notebooks, which do the same thing. Um, but if you are standardizing real life, it's good practice um, uh, to standardize on the training set data only. When we come later into the course into things like um, neural networks, you'll see uh, similar approaches where you want to avoid crossover and sort of bleeding of test data into training data. And you'll see how we, we avoid that. Um, but we'll talk more about that a bit later in, in the module. But I'm flagging it up for now, just so that's, 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 uh, that's good practice in, in real life. So we've done our three steps. We have split our data into features and labels. We've uh, split our data into uh, training and test data. Uh, and we've um, normalized or standardized our data. We've done some feature scaling. Um, so once we've done all of that, um, we're ready to do the actual logistic regression. Um, and uh, after all this build up, uh, you may be expecting some really complicated code. Um, nope. Here is the code that does a logistic regression, uh, and uh, this, that is literally it. Uh, so you, you've got far more code actually getting your data ready than uh, actually doing the logistic regression itself. All we do is we create an instance of a logistic regression uh, model, which we've imported, remember, from, uh, uh, from sklearn. And then we call the fit method on that model and we pass in uh, just our training data. Remember, we, we don't want to give it the test data. It needs to train only on the training data. So we pass in the features from our training data, X train, and the labels from our training data, Y train. Okay. 
So that creates an instance of a logistic regression model that fits it. You can, in fact, do that on one line of code if you so chose and combine those two, but uh, it's I, I always prefer to separate that out. Um, very, very simple. That's it. That's all you have to do. So uh, I wasn't kidding when I said you don't need to understand the maths behind it. However, I do think there is huge value in, in, in understanding how these things work under the bonnet, because um, as I say, a lot of machine learning is uh, making decisions about how to tweak your model or try different approaches. Um, and that kind of requires an understanding of how they're working at a fundamental level, at least broadly. You don't need to understand all the uh, particularly when you get into neural networks, I don't understand the maths behind neural networks. I was taught it once many years ago um, as part of my degree, and that put me off neural networks. So you don't need to go down that route. Um, but uh, getting a, an understanding for how these things work more generally um, will uh, will stand you in good stead. Um, I should just flag up in this example here. Um, I've passed in X train and um, uh, Y train here. Um, in reality, uh, so this is essentially supposed to represent our standardized data, okay? Um, in reality, and I think in the examples you'll be looking at this morning, you will probably, once you've standardized your data, it may not be any, any longer called X train. You might have called it something like X train stand, because it's good practice not to overwrite your original data um, in case you want to do something else with it. So, so you want to try normalizing it instead, you can go off in a different direction. Um, so in reality, the thing you're passing in there may well be called something like X train standard. It depends what you've called it. Um, but whatever you pass in, that needs to be the standardized data, not the original raw data with the features on very different scales. Okay, so I'm just flagging that up. I've done, I've done it for simplicity, but you'll see in the examples this morning how, how this works. So that's training. That's really easy. Once the model has been trained, we can then use it to generate predictions. And remember, training of a machine learning model is known as fitting uh, because we're trying, trying to fit a line of best fit, essentially just a very complex line now. Um, so once we can, once we've uh, fitted the model, uh, we can generate predictions and then that allows us to test uh, the accuracy and other metrics, we explored some of those last week, things like precision and recall as well, um, and other things that we'll look at today. Um, we can test the accuracy of the predictions on both the training set and the test set. And it's really easy to generate predictions from a fitted model um, using the scikit-learn library. We simply call uh, dot predict on our model. So dot fit basically means train it, dot predict basically means make some predictions from your trained model. So you have to fit it first before you can predict from it. Uh, and all we're doing here is we, uh, this line of code uh, passes in um, the, uh, the feature data from our training set. So uh, that will then try to predict the corresponding labels from our training examples. And uh, this second line of code here uh, we're passing in the feature data from our test set, which it hasn't seen, it hasn't trained on this. Um, so it'll then generate the Y labels, its prediction of what each output label should be for these features that it hasn't seen. Okay, so that then allows us to uh, get its predictions for the data that it has been trained on and the data that it hasn't. Okay, wow, that was bang on time. I allowed 60 minutes. I, I couldn't have done that better if I tried. Um, uh, okay, Sammy, are there, I see quite a few things in the chat, but I, I can't see the chat itself. I just see there's a lot of numbers. Um, any sort of pressing questions that have come up that haven't been answered? Um, I think we're mostly there. I'm just compiling them into a Q&A document just because I think there's useful ones there that people might want to refer back to. Um, so any that I haven't answered now, I'll make sure that we answer over the exercise and get back to people on those. I think there's only, I think most of them have been answered at this point. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Okay, fantastic. So hopefully that's all uh, sort of largely made sense. Um, and uh, it's now time for you to try it out. Uh, your very first uh, machine learning experience. So uh, the first thing you do is go on a, a break for 10 minutes. Um, then you're gonna work in your groups uh, for an hour and 20. So we're gonna resume at uh, 12 o'clock. Um, and uh, in the hour and 20, I want you to work in your groups on these three tasks. Um, and I've kind of recommended generally 
uh, a sort of time for each. That's guidance. Feel free to ignore that. Um, it's just how you might want to split your time or if you notice you're spending a bit longer on one section than, than another, um, that it might be just uh, worth uh, bearing that in mind. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to have a look at the notebook that you've been supplied in this repository, uh, Log Reg Tutorial 1. Have one person in your group sharing the screen and uh, walk everyone through uh, the notes and the code in that notebook, running each uh, code cell as you go along. Make sure you're all understanding uh, how everything is working. Uh, then you're going to do the same. Uh, that's a fairly short notebook and it mainly focuses on uh, standardization and normalization and it goes through it manually um, uh, just as so you really get a handle on how that works. Um, then you're going to do the same for this much larger notebook, uh, which is sort of the meat of it, Logistic Regression Tutorial 2. Um, this is the one where you're going to look at uh, applying a logistic regression model to the Titanic data. So you're going to have a go at that. Uh, so that'll take you a bit longer. Um, and then uh, once you've uh, worked through both of these as a group, um, I then want you as a group to open the logistic regression stroke exercise and you've been tasked to train a logistic regression model that tries to predict whether or not a stroke patient will receive clot busting treatment. Um, and you've also been provided with some code uh, that will automatically download the data uh, that you're going to use to do this. Um, now, uh, there's a number of features in that data set. Um, and I provided you with a CSV file called Stroke Data Feature Descriptions. If you have a look in that uh, CSV file, it basically contains all of the column names for your features in that stroke data, along with a description about what some of those column names mean, because some of them you won't understand just by looking at the name, you, they won't make sense. So that explains uh, what each of the column names uh, means. And I want you to see if you can try and train an accurate model. Um, try and identify what you think the most important features are uh, for predicting whether or not a stroke patient can receive uh, or receive um, clot busting treatment. Can you improve your accuracy by uh, adjusting your train test split or maybe dropping some of the features that don't seem quite so important? So you could try exploring that. Um, so when we come back at 12, I'm going to ask a couple groups just uh, uh, to talk us through how they got, got on with that to see if anybody managed to get some nice little uh, little models there. OK, I will open up breakout rooms, go and have a break uh, first uh, for 10 minutes and then uh, you'll work until 12 on this exercise. Let me stop sharing and stop recording. Hi everyone, welcome back. Hmm. So I managed to get around to about half of the rooms, I think, and I think Sammy got to the other rooms that I didn't get to. Um, so it seems like uh, people getting on really well with this um, and uh, both Sammy and I, uh, I noticed some really uh, interesting and creative uh, ways of approaching um, uh, the, the stroke exercise and trying to improve it. So did um, uh, just to ask, did anybody, so uh, in the interest of time, I won't sort of pick out two groups uh, in particular, but um, does anybody just want to uh, uh, sort of chip in? Did anybody manage to improve the performance of the the, the kind of baseline stroke model, um, which just had about fifty features in there? Um, did anybody manage to improve that? And if so, how? Yeah, hi, it's this Luke and Zyla. We we, we um, had a little go and used the RFE module to actually narrow it down to 10 things rather than the full, whatever it was, 50, and oh. got almost as good performance just using 10. Oh, wow. OK. So, uh, yeah, that's that, that, that that's really good. So that indicates there's possibly a, um, a quite a lot of, I mean, certainly with the 50 features, it did look as though there was a lot of stuff in there um, that, that didn't need to be there and, and wasn't really helping. And of course, that can promote an overfit. Um, uh, and we'll talk more about this as we go on, but we mentioned last week, basically an overfit is where you've trained the model for too long. You've, you've, um, so when we come on to neural networks, uh, you'll go, uh, have, uh, you've been introduced to this idea that you keep training for iterations and that can indicate you've, you've trained too much for too long. 
Um, but it can also indicate that your model is too complicated um, and therefore it's trying to, it's finding all these nuances that just aren't, don't give you a very generalizable model. They're just nuances that are more unique to the uh, training data. So um, uh, that's kind of why we wanted to give you a, a, a sort of big training set of lots of features. Um, anybody else manage to do anything to improve things? Uh, in ARM, we removed the stroke, one of the stroke types. So it has I and P, I, H, and we noticed the coefficients were the same, so, but opposite. So one is if it's yes and no, and they're identical. So we took one out and left only one in, which seemed to improve things. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. There is definitely duplication in that data set um, because there are a lot of things that, as you saw in, in a way in the Titanic data, in fact, uh, uh, that the, you know, there are things like um, passenger class and fare, which can be highly correlated. And, and actually, you know, do you need both of those things uh, in there? Is that just adding more complexity or is the class alone or is the fare alone enough? Uh, uh, to get a to get a good decision, um, brilliant. Well, if anybody has had anything, please pop them uh, in the in the chat. Um, but hopefully, that gave you a little bit of an insight into um, how to use logistic regression, um, uh, your first sort of machine learning approach, um, and uh, um, uh, there'll be lots more approaches that that we uh, that we show you over the course of this module. Hopefully, you've seen actually it's pretty easy to be able to do this kind of stuff. You'll also see that aside from things like neural networks, which are a bit different, um, a lot of the methods that uh, Sammy's going to take you through over the coming weeks, the code's very similar to what you've just seen. You're just switching out. Uh, now this line of code looks like this. Um, uh, it's just the uh, understanding the different uh, uh, different kind of approaches there. Um, there was also an interesting question that came up in the last week. I was in uh, TIA um, around um, uh, uh, taking out the you know the, the kind of human factor in feature selection um, and that's a really good question so there are um, uh, uh, the question was sort of kind of raised about well that what it, there might be things in here that we uh, we kind of know instinctively just don't seem to make sense why should they be important why should we be including those um, and or, or conversely the you know it might be the opposite that you're excluding things you think well they should be in there now um, <clears throat> the human aspect of any machine learning uh, approach is incredibly important. We're gonna to touch on a lot of this this afternoon with some really quite shocking, in some cases, examples um, of some of the th ways in which this can go wrong. And it touches on some of these, these things that you're gonna to start to explore. Um, the, the human aspect is massively important. So the, the general advice with machine learning models is initially cast your net wide. In other words, if you've got data, just chuck it in there. Uh, you might have hundreds of features, chuck it all in and see what happens. Then you can start to um, uh, simplify your model, say, well, okay, these things don't seem important. But as you're doing that, you should also be uh, questioning, say, okay, well, does that make sense that these things aren't important? Or the, the opposite, you know, that these features seem to be coming out as the most important. Does that make sense? Now, one of the advantages of machine learning models is that it um, allows us uh, to get a machine to try and unpick things that we may not see or may be difficult for us to see patterns inherent in the data that it might be difficult for us to see as um, human beings but it might also be that it's picked up something that actually isn't truly helping it learn it's just it, it, it's kind of artificial um, and it might be that it's picking up you know sort of a, a bit of a correlation or, or something like that so there is a bit of an art to um, uh, feature selection. Sammy's going to touch a bit more on feature selection a bit later in the module as well. Um, and uh, some of the explainable AI stuff that Sammy will be uh, looking at um, uh, will help you kind of make a lot of these decisions, particularly when you get into neural networks, which are very black box. Uh, and we'll talk more about that, um, uh, that you we don't actually understand how they work. Um, that can be difficult for people to accept particularly if you come from a stats background and you're wanting to kind of rigorously uh, validate these things, you're going to have to trust that neural networks work, but we don't quite know why. Um, but we'll talk more about that in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the neural network session. But the, um, a, a lot of the um, approaches require that, that you'll end up with more questions than answers in a lot of cases. And it's a, um, any machine learning project is a bit of a, a journey as you start to explore things um, 
uh, and you know you will end up going in all sorts of directions um, but hopefully you know if you find that fun there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can explore okay right so we've got 20 minutes before lunch so i'm going to take you through um, some other concepts that um we're not going to have time to show you the code but i'm going to point you to mike's materials on this which as i say uh, all of Mike's materials form the basis of um, exactly the notebooks you've just looked at. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, hopefully they'll be very easy to follow. Um, the uh, apologies, hopefully you saw in the class Tannoy, um, uh, apologies that I did miss a prompt out on the um, exercise you just did on the stroke, uh, where I forgot to tell you <laughs> that you should also split your data into training and test sets. Hopefully most of you picked that up. Um, so uh, apologies, I have now corrected that for the next cohort. Uh, um, I, I just did that very very quickly. Right, let me share my screen. Uh, where are we here? Yeah, exercise one. Right, so I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, important concepts, and these are important concepts, and if you're doing machine learning in real life, uh, you're going to want to do these things. Um, so this isn't a kind of optional nice to have. This is a these are fundamentally important concepts um, that I would encourage you, if you're going to go on and do a machine learning project, um, go and uh, read up on this stuff, because um, you'll need to do it for your, for your work. So, so far, um, when we split our data uh, into training sets and test sets, we've made one split, okay? So we randomly select a percentage of our data to be the training data and a percentage to be the test data. And that's the reason why, uh, you know, in the groups, uh, some people were getting, oh, actually my test set accuracy is much lower or much higher. Most people were getting around 80% on the Titanic, but some people were getting a bit lower. And, and that's because each of you, when you ran the code, um, it would have split the data randomly differently. And you may end up uh, with a training test split that is worse or better for what you need. Um, uh, and you might therefore get a misleading uh, estimate of how good your model actually is. And so just like when we looked at discrete event simulation, where we say, well, it's a stochastic model, we don't just run it once. We could have a run of bad luck or run of good luck. We run it lots and lots of times. And we can do the same thing when we look to randomly split up our data into training and uh, test data. Um, and uh, one of the most popular ways that we can do this is using something known as stratified cave hold uh, validation, which sounds very complicated, but actually is very, very straightforward in principle. So let me first explain what cave hold validation is, and then I'll explain the stratified, stratified bit. So cave hold validation, basically we repeat the uh, mo the, the uh, split of the training uh, and testing uh, k times um, and we train the model and then test it on uh, a, a on a test set k times such that all of the data that we've got is used once but only once as part of the test set so in other words all of our data gets an opportunity once and only once to be the thing against which we check how good our model is rather than against the thing we learn. Um, so uh, that's what uh, k-fold validation is. It basically uh, runs the, 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 the kind of the fitting, the training and the checking against the test set uh, a number of times. Um, uh, and each time it uh, has a test set that it uh, consists of data that it has not used before. Okay. Now in stratified K-fold validation, we do that, but we also ensure that the balance between our different classifications, so for the Titanic data that survived versus died, across all of the data is maintained every time we take a train test split. So in other words, for example, if our original data, we got 60% survived, 40% died. Um, that would be maintained in a stratified k vol validation for every split that's used. So it would always be, it's, it's a 60-40 split in outcomes uh, 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 across the data. We won't take a, uh, 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 we won't slice off a training set that um, uh, has a different proportion. Uh, so it, uh, it does this. And the good news is, 
You don't have to do this manually. There are packages that will do this for you. Um, and we will link you to the instructions on, on, on how you can do that. So stratified K4 validation is uh, the, uh, the, the better way, in fact, I'd say it's the gold standard way for splitting your, your uh, train, training and testing data. So bear that in mind. Um, the examples that you're going to see in this module uh, tend to just use simple train test splits or train validation splits when we get onto um, the, uh, the neural networks. But you can just substitute that in for uh, the, the materials that I'll link to um, at the end. Um, so it's a, it's a good place to start and it makes it easier for you to learn the rest of the concepts. Um, but uh, if you're doing this in reality, you, you probably want to substitute that in for a, a stratified k-fold uh, validation um, to, to be as robust as possible. The other key thing I want to talk about is something known as uh, rock curves. Um, and these are, again, something that you, you pretty much want to be looking at every time you do some machine learning work. And we will look at these a bit more um, uh, as we go on throughout the training. Uh, so you will have a bit of a chance to have a play with these. Um, so uh, rock curves are, stand for receiver operator characteristic curves. Um, some of you may have come across the, the use of these for different um, applications in your analysis, but they're basically um, really useful ways in which we can assess the potential performance of a machine learning model. Okay, and I'll come back to that word potential in a moment. Now, what a rock curve does uh, for a machine learning application is it plots the uh, true positive rate. That's the proportion of cases that it correctly identifies as positive out of all of the positive cases, which some of you may know is sensitivity. So um, in, uh, if your positive is uh, survived in, in uh, the Titanic data, uh, what's the proportion of cases that it correctly identified as survived out of all the ones that did survive? That's the true positive rate. And it plots that against something known as the false positive rate, which is the proportion of cases that are incorrectly identified as positive out of all of the negative cases. That's the inverse of specificity. So somebody asked about sensitivity and specificity last week. Uh, a rock curve plots sensitivity against the inverse of specificity. Um, uh, and another way to look at it is basically the false positives divided by the false positives plus the true negatives. We'll have a little bit more about this in a moment, so don't worry if you're not quite following. So what does that mean? Well, it means if we had a false positive rate of 20%, then 20% of the cases that are actually negative, so in our Titanic example, let's say negative is died, 20% of those passages of, uh, that died, we would incorrectly say they survived. So that's the false positive rate, okay? And what a rock curve does is it plots the true positive rate against the false positive rate for varying prediction thresholds. Now you saw a little bit of about the prediction threshold in the notebooks you were just looking at in the exercise. The prediction threshold is basically the probability value uh, uh, that, it, um, uh, that it uses to determine whether we classify something as positive or negative, belonging to this class or this class, okay? And by default, that's 0.5. So you had a look in the notebook examples that you were looking at, you uh, extracted in one of them, I think it's the Titanic one, the raw probabilities. Um, and what it's basically doing uh, is it says, okay, well, if that probability is above 0.5, I'll say they survived. If it's below 0.5, I'll say they died. And that's basically what it's doing. But you can actually change that prediction threshold. It doesn't have to be uh, 0.5. Uh, and in some cases, you may want to do that, uh, particularly where your class is another way in which you can combat against um, underrepresented classes that it might have learned a bit too much. It might be a bit too confident about one of the classes and not quite confident enough about another. And so by varying the prediction threshold, um, you can uh, you can kind of account for that. Um, and it's another way to kind of kind of tackle that imbalance. 
um, by saying, OK, well, we know your the model essentially is going to be a bit more hesitant um, when it says that they survived versus they died, for example. Um, and so we can account for that in the threshold. We, we will allow the fact that it's, it's not quite as confident when it predicts this. Um, and this is a way in which we can select a better uh, prediction threshold, classification threshold, um, the, uh, and it, it does it allows us to do that in a robust way by seeing what performance we could get if we were to change that. So uh, this is what the rock curve is doing, and this is why I said about potential allows us to measure potential performance of our model, um, because by default it'll say that threshold is 0.5, but actually the rock curve will say, um, but actually it looks like we could get better performance out of this model as it is now. Uh, if we were to change the uh, prediction threshold. So let's just sort of hammer this home uh, a little bit because it is a bit difficult to get your head around. So um, essentially we can imagine um, our true and false uh, positives and our true and false negatives as living in a matrix where we've got the, the real world, the correct answer and the prediction. OK, so a true positive is where in the real world, it was positive and we said it was positive. That's a true positive. And obviously a false um, positive is where we said that it was uh, um, positive, but it wasn't, it was actually negative. So we falsely said it was positive. And exactly the same is true for negative, just the other way around. So a false negative says, uh, sorry, a true negative says um, uh, it was negative in the real world. And I guess that correctly. Uh, whereas a false negative says, I said it was negative and it wasn't, it was actually positive. So sensitivity is the number of true positives divided by the number of true positives plus false negatives. Okay, so in other words, it's this box here divided by that column. That's sensitivity. It's saying, how good are we at finding the positives? It's the percentage of correct positives out of all cases that were actually positive. Specificity is how good are we at finding the negatives? So that's the percentage of correct negatives, true negatives, out of all the cases that were actually negative. Uh, so it's that divided by the sum of this column. However, in a rock curve, we don't plot sensitivity against specificity. We plot sensitivity against the inverse of specificity. So the inverse of specificity is the number of false positives divided by the number of false positives plus true negatives. So in other words, it's this divided by that column instead of this divided by that column. So it's the percentage of incorrect positive predictions out of all cases that were negative. So a rock curve plots this uh, true positive divided by this column against this false positive uh, out of this column. OK, um, and the um, Specif sorry, the one minus specificity, the inverse of specificity is known as the false positive rate and that is plotted on the x-axis and on the y-axis we plot the, tr oops, sorry, uh, sorry, <laughs> I clicked the wrong button on my mouse, uh, apologies, there we go. Um, on the uh, y-axis we plot the, uh, the true positive rate which is the sensitivity, that's much easier to understand because it's sensitivity basically. And we do that for different threshold values for this prediction uh, strip classification threshold. So let's look at a rock curve. So this is an example of a rock curve. OK, so here we've got the false positive rate from zero to one uh, on the X axis and the true positive rate sensitivity from zero to one on the Y axis. OK, so let's uh, to better understand this. Let's look at the various aspects of the curve. So in the bottom left, that's where both the true positive rate and the false positive rate are both zero. OK, that happens when your threshold value is set. Remember this thing that defaults to 0.5 and it says if it's above, it's positive. If it's below, it's negative. This happens down here when your threshold value is set so that nothing is classified as positive. That means that you never pick up cases that are truly positive because you say everything is negative. So your true positive rate is zero. Uh, so that's a bad thing. 
um, because you never pick up positive cases. But on the other hand, you uh, also never say that something is positive when it's negative because you, you say nothing is positive. So that's good. You want basically a low false positive rate and a high true positive rate. So, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's good for that sense, but that's just a very brute force way of saying, well, I'll just say nothing's positive then. And that's an easy way to get your false positive rate at zero. But it doesn't really help you because your true positive rate is also rubbish. Conversely, the top right is where both the true positive rate and the false positive rate are both 100 percent. So uh, as you might imagine, that happens when you set your threshold so that you say everything is positive. So everybody survived on the Titanic. OK, which means you get 100 percent on your true positive rate. You always pick up all of the cases that survived because you're saying that everybody survived. But the, 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 the slight fly in the ointment there, there is that you're also saying that everyone that died survived too. OK, so it's not particularly a useful model. So everything in between those two extreme threshold values basically represent a trade off between picking up more of the positive cases, the true positive rate, but also erroneously classifying more negatives as positives. So there's a trade-off decision where, uh, and you'll very often be making trade-off decisions, say, well, this, if I set the threshold to here, I will pick up more people that survived, but it also means uh, more people that died, I would say they survived. And depending on what you're trying to classify, your trade-off decision may vary. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to, if you're looking at cancer diagnosis, for example, the question may be different. You may be thinking, uh, you know, how you tip that, do you want to, is it more important that you pick up more cases where they do have cancer and accept that people that don't have cancer may accidentally get predicted to have cancer? Is that better than the opposite where you're missing people that have cancer? And depending on what you're trying to do, your decision can vary, but it is a trade-off decision that you're, you're making. So um, basically, you want your stuff to be as near to the top left as possible because that's where you've got a good true positive rate and that's a good thing but you've got a low false positive rate and that's also a good thing you want good uh, you want a high true positive rate but a low false positive rate that's the ideal so a perfect classifier is top left where it just gets everything right it says that everything uh, it always picks out all the positives and it never says the negatives are positive so thresholds that get you up towards the top left are nearer optimal so they're really good at saying something is positive when it is and it's rarely something uh, saying something is uh, positive when it isn't apologies i'm just going to speak on my doorbell uh, there's a package i'm waiting for i'll just ask them to leave it outside sorry two seconds Sorry about that. <laughs> it would have been tied perfectly if I was on time. Um, uh, yeah, so we want them to be up in the top left. This blue dotted line here, okay, that, that runs up the middle, that represents a worthless test. If you've got points that fall along that line, then basically it says the algorithm is no better at predicting a positive correctly than incorrectly. It's a useless model. You may as well toss a coin. Um, because it's not doing anything better than random. Okay, this makes it a really useful reference line. So if we're above that line, we're doing better than random. So we're doing something. It's better than just tossing a coin. Okay. If we get points down at the bottom right, where we're under this line, that's saying that um, our model says that most things are positive when they're actually negative, and when it something is positive it rarely finds it okay what that typically means is you've got an error in your model and you've probably got things the wrong way around you shouldn't see things down in this bottom right because that's basically saying your model is an excellent predictor of exactly the opposite uh, which probably means you made a mistake in most cases unless there's something very weird going on so what you're looking for in a rock curve is 
to be above this blue line because that means you're doing better than uh, random and you want it to be reaching up uh, as much as possible into this top left corner and you're going to try and pick a threshold um, that, that has a trade-off uh, which gets you nearer to the top left corner um, with an acceptable kind of false positive rate. Now you can just look at this uh, uh, as a kind of visual inspection to determine uh, how good your model could be and what your th thresholds uh, might might be uh, to get a better performing uh, model. Um, but we can also uh, use something a bit more rigorous and we can use something uh, known as the AUROC, which is the area under the receiver operator characteristic curve. OK, um, and that basically gives us an area. It calculates the area under the curve, as its name might suggest. Um, and any area greater than 0.5, which is half of the area, is better than random. That means we've gone, so 0.5 is basically, uh, well, that's just half the area. That's just going to be, it, it hasn't gone above our random classifier line. So anything greater than 0.5 means we've, we've popped above that line. So we're doing better than random. Hopefully you want to be doing quite a bit better than random. Um, and an area of one would represent a perfect model. You won't get that. But um, that's a perfect classifier where it always gets everything right all of the time. So as I said, we won't go into the, uh, uh, the details of how you do this, but it is fairly straightforward uh, to be able to do this and also to read off um, how uh, you, you then pick your uh, kind of uh, classification threshold and then set that. Um, so here are the links uh, to Mike's materials on that. Um, here's the link to the, uh, the notebook on stratified K-fold validation. Again, this is all using the same Titanic data that you've been using this morning. Um, and here's the link about uh, rock and all rock. So I would strongly recommend uh, that you read these materials because if you're doing um, machine learning in practice in the real world, um, you're going to want to do these things. And it's probably worth flagging up that you know, any, uh, any of your projects that you do, whether it's machine learning or not, the stuff you learn in this course will serve you as a kind of good starting point. But most HSMAs will then go off and need to read other things. You, you will first, you, even if you're doing a discrete event simulation, you'll sit down and realise, oh, hang on, I'm going to need to do this. How am I going to do that? And you, this is a common thing that you will encounter. So you'll have to go off and then, uh, so a lot of your project time will also be, you know, exploring other things in that field as well. Um, but uh, this hopefully gives you the kind of the grounding of the basics. And certainly these two are going to be things you're going to want to use uh, pretty much uh, from the off. You will see a bit more of um, uh, rock and all rock uh, later in this module. I've got a funny feeling that Sammy's using, uh, do you use k validation in your stuff, Sammy? So I couldn't find the unmute. I think I do recommend it as an extension in a couple of exercises. Okay, okay cool. So yeah, so you, th there are glimpses of this, but th these are certainly things that you want to um, uh, that you want to use for real world projects. Okay. Oh, is that? Oh, it's the final slide. That's really odd. It didn't click off. Um, okay. Apologies, over around by four minutes, uh, but we'll stop for lunch now. Uh, so well done, everyone, this morning. Uh, uh, your first taste of a machine learning model. Go and have lunch now. We'll resume at uh, one thirty, um, uh, when we'll talk this afternoon about uh, some of the really important ethical issues uh, around this and how you can accidentally find yourself when you're designing these kind of models, uh, creating things that are unintentionally hugely problematic. Um, and so uh, we'll be talking more about that this afternoon. We've got some really interesting examples to show you. Great. See you all at 1.30.